All right. Well, we're in Acts chapter 12. If you want to uh, turn there. And I've uh, <coughs> been gone for a few weeks. So uh, when we left off, uh, we just got Paul and Barnabas up to the uh, church there in Antioch, Antioch, Syria, uh, which was a very cosmopolitan town, uh, a very cross-cultural place and a crossroads uh, of the world of uh, Asia at that time. Uh, and God's doing a tremendous work there. Uh, the spotlight in terms of Luke's narrative and Acts is about ready to shift there and stay there. Uh, but uh, in this chapter, we come back to Jerusalem uh, for one more time. Uh, and uh, very intentional, uh, we believe, on uh, Luke's part to make sure we, we remember and realize here is the church, here's the foundation of the church, here's where the church grew out of uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, we're going to see the spotlight going back on Peter in a miraculous event uh, once again as the church is praying for him. Uh, and then, in a sense, he's going to walk off the pages of scriptures. We're going to see a few more uh, references to him. Uh, but after this chapter, things will very much shift then to the missionary journeys, uh, Paul and Barnabas, and then eventually Paul uh, in silence. Uh, we entitled the message, uh, Two Opposing Forces. And uh, we just kind of sang about them. Uh, in that last song, we're in a, a war, but it's a war of love. Uh, but there's definitely a war going on out there in our own world. Uh, and there's a war going on here in this passage. As we see the king, or King Herod in this case, uh, warring against God's people uh, and how they uh, respond. Uh, Peter's in prison. Uh, and later when he's writing his first epistle, he actually <laughs> quotes Psalm 34, verses 15 and 16. And you have to wonder if uh, maybe this psalm was going on in his mind that night uh, in the dungeon where he says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Uh, you can almost take that psalm and outline this, this passage, uh, because the Lord is certainly with Peter during this time. And this section concludes with God dealing uh, in a very graphic way those that do evil, in this case, Herod. Let's take a look at the first four verses where uh, we've entitled that persecution begins again because there was kind of a lull in things, and now uh, it begins again in Jerusalem. Verse 1 of chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, or Passover, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep, uh, to, uh, keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So uh, first the per persecution begins, as we said, because Herod uh, sought to please the crowd. It kind of, there's so many Herods in the Bible, we kind of have to always talk about who, uh, who this one is. This is Herod Agrippa. Uh, and uh, verse 3 says, because he saw that it pleased the, the Jews. Kind of have to understand who he is and why he would even care about pleasing. Uh, again, this is not the Jews in general. It's the Sanhedrin that's being talked about. They're all Jewish. So uh, when it says, and the Jews, that's why I like uh, uh, David Stern's uh, translation. He'll always, when it's referring to the Sanhedrin in particular, he'll just translate it the Judean. So you, you see, at least see a distinction here. This is a particular group of people he's trying to please. Uh, this Herod is the grandson of Herod the Great, who killed the, uh, the babies there in Bethlehem. Uh, his uncle is the one that beheaded uh, John the Baptist. Uh, he kind of uh, grows up uh, really in poverty and great humility for a period of time uh, in Israel. Uh, he then goes to uh, live uh, in Rome. He lives there for 30 years, where he uh, grows up with the a few people that play a, a, a very significant role in his life later. Uh, he, he returns to Rome as an adult where apparently he says a few critical remarks of uh, Emperor Tiberius uh, that were so critical it gets him thrown into prison. He remains in prison until one of his childhood friends, a man named Caligula, uh, ascends to the throne uh, and then he is delivered out of prison, as one writer said. Uh, the, the gold in the chain around his neck was greater than the iron fetters that had held him in prison uh, at that time. So he, uh, he is now out of prison. Uh, he is appointed by Caligula to be uh, over some of the provinces of Palestine. Uh, and then another childhood 
friend, arises to the throne of Rome. His name is Claudius, uh, and uh, he uh, makes then this Herod ruler over Judea, Samaria, uh, and, uh, all, which was uh, a major portion of the Roman Empire at that time. Uh, as one writer said, murder and intrigue were the currency of his life, like the other Herods, uh, and he was the preeminent politician. There is no proculator, no man like Pontius Pilate ruling at that time. That position has been done away with, so he is the ruler. Therefore, he can say, arrest James, execute James. Uh, he is accountable to, uh, to no one. Again, why would he want to even uh, please the Sanhedrin? Uh, or care about them. Uh, he's an Ed Edomite himself. Again, the Edomites are descendants of Esau, uh, long enemies of Israel. Uh, but during the period of the Maccabees, uh, they basically conquer the Edomites and uh, merge and bring them in uh, as part of the, uh, the state of Israel. His mother is Jewish, though, and she's a descendant of the Maccabee, which makes them, well, it makes him kind of very unique in terms of, uh, uh, of history anyway. Uh, he liked to keep the Jewish feast. He made the sacrifices and so forth. He did what he could to try to uh, appease the Jews, to try to win them over to somehow accept him, not just as their appointed king, but as their true king. Uh, again, a politician. Uh, he rebuilds the wall and helps build the wall in 44 AD uh, around the temple area, uh, much of which you can see it uh, this day. It's still there, the portion of the wall that uh, this particular Herod uh, built. We're going to meet his son later in the book of Acts. Paul will have to give a testimony and a statement uh, before him. But again, he's persecuting the church as a way to say, I'm loyal to the fathers uh, of our faith and, uh, and trying to be accepted uh, by the Sanhedrin and by the Jewish people. Uh, he sees that it pleased the Jews in order to execute James. So now he arrests Peter uh, for the... Uh, uh, and. Uh, certainly intending to do the same thing to execute him, but he must wait now until after Passover, uh, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Secondly, the persecution began, but James and Peter believed the promises of God. And uh, you say that, uh, I'm not too sure about that. James is the guy that got executed. Well, I think we certainly could say still, though, uh, James was faithful to his faith and believed all of the promises of God uh, in terms of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Uh, every, every time we see something like this happen, whether in Scripture or in life or someone, we would say their life is ended prematurely. There's all the questions about uh, why did this happen? How could this happen? Uh, but we also want to remind ourselves between these two men in terms of James, who now is in heaven, and Peter, who still has years of ministry ahead of him, which of the two is better off? I think James is saying, I'm okay. I'm okay up here with the Lord in heaven. Uh, again, uh, death is the entry uh, into the kingdom of God uh, for many of us. Of course, we're, we're praying for that rapture where we don't ever have to uh, uh, face death itself. <clears throat> but it's hard to accept sometimes when someone is taken, as we say, prematurely. Uh, it's not a, a, a cop-out uh, to say that, uh, as we quote Isaiah the prophet, that uh, God's ways are higher than our ways and so forth. Uh, but we really don't know. We don't have all the answers. But we do believe that James was firmly believing the promises of God right into the time of his martyrdom. Uh, and he actually agreed to it ahead of time. You remember the story when James and John, the sons of thunder, uh, send their mother to Jesus to ask for a favor recorded in Matthew 20, 21, where it says, And he, Jesus, said to her, the mother of James and John, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am about to be baptized with? They said to him, We are. And he did. Uh, he followed Jesus in terms of uh, being executed very close to the time that Jesus, at least the time of year that Jesus was executed uh, as well. One on the cross, one by the sword, uh, but either way, this had to really shake up the early church. Uh, Stephen had been martyred. Uh, there had been times of persecution and times of grace and the spread of God's word. Now persecution is coming, and it's coming by a man who seems very, very vicious 
uh, and he's the man that's in complete control. He doesn't have to ask permission from anybody to imprison or execute uh, anyone. Uh, again, that passage in Isaiah 55, 8, and 9 that we think of in these situations is, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In context, Isaiah is talking about the grace of God, uh, the mercy of God. It's hard for us to fathom. It's hard for us to get our mind around how much God loves us and so forth. But his ways are beyond our figuring out. And sometimes we simply say, uh, when someone is taken from us prematurely, we might say that we don't know, we don't have the answers. We just uh, weep with those that weep. Uh, we uh, sorrow with those that sorrow. Uh, but we're thankful for those like James that know the Lord to know they're immediately in the presence of, of God. Peter is sentenced to be beheaded. The same thing is going to happen. Uh, and yet he is able seemingly to sleep through the night. When the angel comes, as we'll read about in a moment, Peter uh, has to be uh, uh, prodded and, and woken up just to, uh, to get him out of the prison. Now, he'd been in prison on two other occasions. Uh, this is not the first time that he's been there. But this is the first time he's been alone in prison. This is the first time deliverance did not come right away. The other two times uh, were he was able to witness uh, in prison. Uh, there were no special witnessing opportunities that we read about here. And the previous arrest had taken place after great uh, victories, at least uh, spiritual victories. Uh, but now this arrest is followed by the death of James. Uh, this is uh, clearly a different situation. Uh, so how could Peter sleep uh, through the night? Well, one thing we know, the church was praying for him 24-7 for about a week or so. Uh, and certainly... The prayers of God's people can certainly help bring the promises of God's word uh, to our hearts and minds uh, at a time like this. But he was really relying on a particular promise that's found in John 21, 17. There Jesus said to him, uh, to Peter, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you are, were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you stretched out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Uh, Peter wasn't an old guy yet. <laughs> he was still a young guy. Jesus said he wouldn't die. He wouldn't be taken uh, and, uh, and executed until he was old. So he had uh, the word of God. He had a promise of God that said, whatever Herod thinks he's doing, whatever it thinks he's going to accomplish, uh, regardless of the fact that he actually is chained not by one, which is the normal, but now with, uh, uh, between two prisoners or two soldiers, he's got uh, two out front. Uh, they're uh, operating on a three-hour shift. Nobody's going to sleep, uh, but he knew that God could still deliver him uh, either that night or the next morning. So he decides... He might as well get a little shut-eye, and uh, uh, it kind of goes out, out for the night. And we would say that certainly any time we're in a dungeon, if we can remember the promises of God, we'll be able to sleep through the night. Uh, we have some sleepless nights, don't we, at time? I've got jet lag. I have an excuse. Uh, most of the times I don't. Uh, I love the song that we, we sing because it's, uh, it's about those fears and the anxiety and the future and what will happen uh, and can we sing and can we pray, O oh Lord, deliver, deliver us? I love that song. It sounds like it's from Lord of the Rings. I don't know if you can get that. I picture small people with long beards playing that song. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that. You'll get that image in your head from, from now on. But uh, again, uh, those dungeons do, uh, do come, uh, those times in the night where we can rely upon God's promises. Uh, Joshua said this after uh, taking the land God gave them. Uh, the land of Israel, and before he's ready to uh, basically divide it up between the 12 tribes. In Joshua 21, 45, he says, Not a word failed, or any good thing which the Lord has spoken to the house of Israel all came to pass. Later, Solomon would, would say similar in 1 Kings eight fifty six, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of his, uh, all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. Peter would later say this, 
the man in prison that night about God's promises in his second epistle, chapter 1, verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So persecution has come uh, once again, uh, and it's a question of how the church would answer. Uh, Peter's trusting in the promises of God, as we should as well, uh, but we see that uh, it's the prayers of the church uh, that are answered miraculously. And that's in the, most of the portion of the rest of the narrative, verse 5 to 19. Uh, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, uh, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now therefore an angel of the Lord stood beside him, and light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. And so he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Uh, when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down this one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. <coughs> And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness she did not open the gate but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go, tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then, as soon as it was day, there was no uh, small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when, Pete, when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So the church, again, we notice constant uh, in prayer, fervent uh, in prayer. Uh, many people praying uh, day and night, apparently, and say, it's a 24-hour prayer chain that's going on on, uh, on behalf of, uh, of Peter. And uh, I have, you know, the, the very first time I went out on a, a short-term mission trip, the uh, uh, church was a lot smaller then, but because I was, I was going to India and I was going to Pakistan and I'd, I'd be there for a little while, not quite as dicey as it is today, but uh, uh, there were certainly uh, concerns. You can tell I wouldn't exactly blend in. And... Uh, uh, so I was there for a while. So they decided they would have a, a, I was very impressed by this and appreciated. They actually had a 24-hour prayer chain. So 24 hours a day for three and a half weeks, people in our church were praying hour by hour. Uh, and it was, uh, it was an awesome trip and it was an awesome experience to know somebody was uh, praying for me constantly. It was just that in Singapore, that car accident and the thing in the back of the cab that flew and caught me in the back of the head. And I thought, who's praying now? You know, I, What's the time difference in Hawaii? I'm going to check that clock when I get back here. Somebody dropped the ball. But I uh, wasn't injured seriously and uh, made my way back. But uh, uh, what an awesome thing to have somebody praying for you 24 hours a day. Uh, and that's what they're doing here for, uh, for Peter. Uh, the entire scene is miraculous. <clears throat> it's also comical. I, you know, it all happens. I think this is one of those things that later they tell the story and they crack up, you know, about Peter getting to the gate. We could say God, God delivered him out of prison, but couldn't get him into a prayer meeting. You know, there's a, kind of a, a little bit of irony there. But the first thing we notice about Peter is just his obedience to the angel. Verse 8, then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals, 
Uh, and so he did. And he said to him, uh, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and didn't know what was done by the angel was real, uh, but thought that he was seeing a vision. I just have to make the casual observation. Uh, this confirms uh, to me that Peter was a coffee drinker. Uh, if you're not a coffee drinker, you don't understand this. The angel shows up and wakes him up. And the angel has to say, put on your sandals. Tie your sandals. Put on your garment. Get your staff. Are you listening? Follow me. And then he goes through the whole thing and he comes out in the street. Probably, you know, Starbucks right there and has a cup and then realized that was an angel. Sure enough, I thought I was just seeing a vision. But uh, uh, you know, it's like, it's like a, a, you know, a parent talking to a child. Put your shoes on tight and try to get them out of the house early in the morning. Uh, but very obedient uh, to, to the Lord. Uh, I think also these verses are interesting because they link the miraculous with the normal. Uh, and I think God does that uh, so often uh, in our daily lives. Uh, the angel could have just put the shoes on him. The angel could have just <laughs> had him dressed and, and got him out of there. But he combines the, the natural with the miraculous. Jesus multiplies loaves and fishes, but he commands the disciples to, to distribute them and then even keep the leftovers. He raises uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead, but then to tell the parents, hey, give her something to eat. Or in words, if he said, God alone can do the extraordinary, but his people must do the ordinary. Uh, it's how we live for him uh, in our daily lives. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, but it took a bunch of guys to roll that stone out of the way uh, so, so he could come out. Again, the same angel that removed the chains from Peter's hands certainly could have managed to get his shoes on his feet, uh, but he asked him to do something very ordinary uh, in the midst of the miraculous that was being done. Uh, and that all is done, and the obvious thing we see here is in response to the church that's praying. Uh, certainly, Jesus taught a lot about prayer and the, the need to persevere in prayer. Luke 18, 7 says, uh, and, uh, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, crying out, praying, uh, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, if you look at it in context, you read the parable that he's uh, expressing there and so forth. Uh, the faith is persevering in prayer. When Jesus returns to planet Earth for his church, will he find them persevering uh, in prayer or not? That seems to be a question. It seems to uh, be in doubt. But certainly the early church is moved and driven uh, and accomplished so much in such a short period of time uh, because they were pretty serious uh, about prayer. Uh, and then we notice that uh, Peter came to know that God was with him even in the dungeon. Verse 11, and when Peter had come to himself, whether that was with a cup of coffee or not, I, I don't really know for sure. I'm just saying. He said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod. Uh, you know, in uh, Hebrews 1.14, it says uh, of angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Uh, the church is praying. Uh, Peter comes to realize that uh, God was with me in that dungeon. I was able to sleep trusting the promise of God, uh, and I've been delivered. God was with me all the way. I can trust him for the greater things that he has for me or the more difficult things he has for me in the future. And God operates that way, certainly in our lives uh, as well. Uh, he brings the little deliverances so that we can trust him in greater ways. If we'll remember, if we'll think about it, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, God does, you know, it's like the guy that was... Uh, you know, uh, downtown looking for a parking place and there just seemed to be none available. So he cries out to the Lord, oh Lord, you know, just, I've got a meeting. Please help me find a parking place. And all of a sudden one opens right in front of him. He pulls in and goes, that's okay, God, I got it. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're, we're saying these prayers about ordinary things and then we, it works out and we think, I got it. No, uh, we need to acknowledge the Lord, uh, what he's doing so we can remember what he's capable of doing uh, in a greater capacity in the future. Uh, secondly, the church didn't believe the answer to the prayer. And certainly here's the uh, irony. Uh, Peter knew where to find him. Goes to the home of uh, uh, John Mark's mother, uh, evidently a, a very uh, well-known uh, in the community. Uh, they were a family of some means, some say uh, wealthy, uh, having a larger home. And that's why the church was uh, obviously uh, meeting there. Uh, and certainly there were people that were praying for Peter that uh, Maybe that he would have the courage to die a good death. 
Maybe others were praying for him that uh, uh, he'd have the opportunity uh, to give God the glory through some kind of testimony or witness uh, before his death. But apparently there were a few people that believed that God could deliver him. And they were praying uh, just for that. And it was their prayers uh, that were uh, answered uh, here. Again, many people praying, praying very earnestly, praying night uh, and day, uh, and praying very specifically for his deliverance. Uh, we could say that, uh, again, God could get him out of the prison, but can't get him into uh, the prayer meeting. Now, we've got to give Rhoda uh, our, uh, here a little bit of a credit, whose name means Rose. Uh, she at least had the courage to go open the door. Now, keep in mind, uh, she's in the home of a, that is well known as being a Christian home. Uh, in that community. Uh, James have been executed. Peter's been arrested awaiting execution, and there's a knock on the door in the middle of the night. Very well could have been the, the guards of Herod, uh, but at least she had the courage to open the door and find out. A little excited, <laughs> so she shuts the door in Peter's face and goes in and reports to everyone that uh, Peter's been delivered outside. Uh, and of course, the conversation that uh, uh, ensues and uh, must be his angel. Maybe he's dead already, and uh, uh, this is uh, just something else of his guardian angel coming to say goodbye to us or something. Uh, very interesting that uh, even prayers given in doubt uh, are still answered on this particular occasion. Then notice Peter's instruction. Tell James. Again, this is the half-brother of, uh, of Jesus, uh, someone that was a critic and a doubter of Jesus until his uh, post-resurrection, till his death and his resurrection. Paul tells us uh, very interesting in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, uh, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So uh, Jesus shows up to see his brother, his half-brother, uh, and tell him, hey, here I am. I've, I've risen from the dead. James becomes the, the, a leader and the pastor of the church there in Jerusalem. We're going to see him in that role and in that capacity at the Council of Jerusalem, very importantly, uh, in chapter uh, 15. But, uh, you know, we laugh at this, but sometimes we're not any better. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where uh, somebody comes to you and say, hey, you remember so-and-so we were praying for? They got saved. And you respond by going, amazing. <laughs> no, you're supposed to go, I knew that. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, we're praying, but do we, do we really believe the prayers? Yeah. And it is exciting when somebody we prayed for for a long time to get saved. Because after a while, you start going, uh, you know. You know, it's been five years, 10 years, 20 years. Is this people, person really going to get saved? Uh, it's funny. Sometimes our, our reaction is no better. It's easy to laugh at these guys, easy to criticize these guys. But uh, uh, I think they, uh, they pretty much are right where we at, are at as well. Uh, when Peter left that meeting, he goes to, uh, <clears throat> he goes to an undisclosed uh, location. And, uh, and apparently it's a well-kept secret. Uh, and that's it, as I said uh, earlier in the introduction. It pretty much walks off the pages of Scripture. Now, we have his two epistles. Uh, we have references to him. Uh, Paul will make reference to him uh, on a few occasions. Uh, he'll voice his opinion at that council uh, in Jerusalem in Acts 15. Uh, but but the, uh, pretty much walks out of the spotlight of Scripture uh, at this point. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.5 tells us that he traveled with his wife. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 1.12, it suggests he visited the uh, churches there in Corinth. Uh, there's no evidence in Scripture that uh, he uh, visited the, the church in Rome, although, according to church history, he is executed uh, on a cross, as you know, upside down, outside of Rome, uh, at the order of Caesar Nero. Uh, but Peter kind of walks off the Scripture after this miraculous event. So persecution begins, but the church answers through prayer, uh, and then thirdly, in what seems like a, kind of a, a very strange little uh, couple of verses in Scripture to follow this uh, is verse 20 to 23. Uh, and I've entitled, The Purpose of Man is to Glorify God, because uh, here's a man that doesn't glorify God, and that's Herod, uh, and we'll see what happens to him. Uh, verse 20, Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, uh, but they came to him uh, with one accord, and having made Blastus, the king's personal aid, their friend, uh, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. Uh, so on a, day, uh, on a set day, Herod arrayed, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne, and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, 
because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms uh, and died. Uh, this uh, event actually is recorded in secular history as well. Uh, Josephus is in his Antiquities of the Wars of the Jews actually describes the event, gives us some historical details uh, about it. Uh, but here it goes to Caesarea, big, uh, big Roman city uh, and uh, beautiful area. Uh, it is today just north of, uh, of Tel Aviv. Uh, if you do a tour of the Israel, this is your first stop. There, uh, the, uh, uh, there's a, uh, uh, a big amphitheater that's there, probably where Herod uh, gave this speech. Uh, overlooking the ocean, uh, not far from it, uh, uh, there is uh, where uh, would have been holding. These are games that are being held in honor of Claudius. Josephus tells us it's the second day of the games uh, when this occurs. Uh, and in the uh, excavations there, the, you can see where they had the chariot races or the bleachers are all there. We actually sat in the bleachers last time for our morning devotions overlooking the, uh, the Mediterranean and so forth. Uh, you can walk on the, uh, the foundation uh, and where the pillars are, where Paul stood trial uh, for both of the trials that we're going to cover uh, in, a, in a little while. And uh, maybe when we get there, I'll, I'll dig up some of the uh, uh, slides of, uh, of our trip uh, being there and so forth. But uh, a beautiful area. Josephus tells us that uh, the garment that he was wearing was silver, pure silver that was uh, woven into this garment. Uh, probably addressing the crowd towards the later part of the day, the sun going down over the Mediterranean, he really would have been quite the sight uh, on his throne in the silver garment completely uh, lit up. Uh, the people begin to shout that you're a God, uh, and he accepts their worship, uh, and then God basically strikes him dead. Uh, he is eaten by worms that took five days before he died. No one would come near him simply because of the stench of what was going on in his body. And it's not the only kind of time that's happened. The same thing happened to Antichus Epiphany, another man who was very cruel uh, to the Jewish people. Uh, in about 164 B.C., when he conquers Jerusalem, he takes a pig and he sacrifices it right on God's altar in order to desecrate the, the temple. Uh, the occasions when this has happened, it's happened to people that were murderous, and torturous, uh, and in particular, uh, of God's people. It doesn't happen very often where God just simply strikes somebody dead and does it in such a way uh, that uh, people can see that it's God and nobody wants that to happen to them. Uh, here's a man that took all the glory for himself, uh, and yet uh, our whole lives are supposed to be about uh, giving God the glory. Uh, Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved uh, images. It's 44 AD, he's 54 years old at the time, and I said he dies uh, five years later. There's another man coming on the scene uh, in the future that is like this as well. He's called the man of sin or the man of perdition. We call him the Antichrist. He also will command worship of the entire world, and Jesus Christ will return and judge and destroy him as well. Or in words we said, the world still lives for praise and pleasure. Man has made himself his own God. The world still lives on the physical and ignores the spiritual. It lives by force and flattery instead of faith and truth, and one day uh, it will be judged. Now, in contrast to that, as the Catechism said, says, it is the chief end of man to glorify God. That's what our lives are to be uh, all about. Paul says in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In Revelation, we have this uh, scene in heaven where it says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him, who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Uh, one of the great ways that we can give God the glory is simply repenting of our sins. We turn to faith in Jesus Christ and, uh, and we receive what his son has done for us on the cross. Uh, and we accept by faith Jesus' finished work 
uh, on the cross on our behalf, place our faith in his death and his resurrection. There's no greater way to give God glory than that. But certainly he wants us to give him glory by the way we live our lives as well. Uh, often we're, we're looking for the, the, the big scenes. I mean, you know, the, the last Super Bowl, I forget that team that won somewhere up there in Seattle, somewhere, I forget exactly which one. But the, on that team, the, the, uh, the quarterback is an outspoken Christian. Uh, so some of us anyway, I think we're waiting with bated breath, so to speak, to see if he would give God the glory. You know, they're going to put the mic in front of us. Uh, in front of his face after the game at some point in uh, some time. And I think he got a few words in there. <laughs> I think it fell short for what uh, some of us were hoping. But uh, uh, we're always hoping that that Christian athlete, that Christian movie star, I think there are some, and uh, others that are out there that have notoriety. Uh, on those big events, we're waiting for them to give glory to God. But I think it's in the ordinary, in the everyday, uh, that we probably have the most opportunity to give God the glory by the way that we live our lives in reflection of his love and mercy. Well, let's go on to our last verse and last point. The power of the church was based on prayer. Verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. So uh, again, this is a uh, summary statement by Luke. He uses it several times uh, in, the, in the book uh, to let us know that uh, there's a change that's coming and he wants to summarize uh, what's been taking place. Uh, persecution has come against the church. The way the church responded was in prayer, uh, and God brought uh, deliverance, uh, and now the word of God grew and multiplied, uh, and we're about ready to, uh, to launch now Paul and Barnabas uh, into their first uh, missionary journey. Uh, but again, the, uh, the premise or the title of the message, Two Opposing Forces, uh, and uh, certainly we see it in the text, uh, and we see it in our daily lives. It was only a few weeks ago that uh, uh, ESPN hired uh, an announcer, uh, but then it found out that he was an evangelical Christian, so he was fired uh, immediately. There was just a case where a uh, CEO of one of the uh, search engines uh, on the web was hired uh, in that type of position. He was fired when it found out that he was an evangelical Christian. That is the bottom line when somebody is pro-life <coughs> and when they are pro-traditional marriage. Because when they find out you're pro-traditional marriage, that means you're anti-gay, uh, and now you have an onslaught of uh, websites uh, and people that are uh, politically minded and motivated uh, that will come against and launch against uh, people, at least in high-profile positions, to have them be removed. And they're very successful. Uh, I just, uh, and, uh, while we were gone, I had read about the, uh, these two brothers uh, kind of caught my attention but from North Carolina. They're both uh, prior professional baseball players. Uh, they were ready to launch a uh, show on HG called Flip It Forward, uh, David uh, and, uh, and Jason uh, Benham. And uh, I'm going to show you a little video clip of them here uh, in closing uh, in a minute. Uh, but they had, a, you know, very great entrepreneurs doing a great thing, very ethical guys and uh, blessing a lot of people. And uh, HG, I heard about them uh, and uh, basically filmed uh, filmed a show, and it was ready to launch in the fall, uh, but uh, it turned out they were evangelical Christians. Uh, they, they were, their big crimes, pro-life, pro-traditional marriage. Uh, they were attacked, they were smeared, things were said about them that were not true and so forth. HG dropped the show. Uh, within a week or so, uh, their bank, who handles uh, the listings uh, for a lot of their real estate uh, uh, investments and so forth. Uh, SunTrust Bank dropped them uh, as well uh, through uh, uh, FRC and some other Christian organizations. Word got out about that, and uh, SunTrust was inundated with uh, thousands of, of phone calls. Go figure. There's other Christians in this country that might actually be doing some banking with them, and they let them know that they didn't appreciate it. SunTrust uh, changed, and uh, they repented, and uh, uh, and uh, kept the listings uh, for their corporation uh, and company. I want to play you their response because that's what I appreciate, uh, what they had to say, some of the other interviews I've seen. Uh, but this response is a thank you, and I, I think it's relative to our, our message this morning. This has been a roller coaster ride. It's, uh, to say that it's fun would be an understatement, but to say that it's scary would also be an understatement. David's had a we, little more fun than I have. No, I have not. Yes, you have. But we just wanted to say thank you. We, we um, were overwhelmed yesterday with this SunTrust debacle 
and SunTrust heard from America. It was unbelievable what took place. But one thing that we want to encourage Americans is that it's so important right now. There's a fracture in our nation, and religious liberty and freedom to think and freedom to express our beliefs is right now fractured, and our nation needs us. And our message really is to the church. And the Apostle Paul says in the books, book of Acts, repent and return that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So we're just praying that there's a supernatural gift of repentance to the church in our own lives, in our own homes, in our churches, which will transform our cities and then ultimately transform this nation. That's really our message. And Jason's got something about being a bully if we don't <laughs> repent. Well, he's a bully apart from repentance. So am I. David and I have said to everybody, so many folks have stood with us and we, we've seen a remnant of people that are saying, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be bold. I'm, I'm not going to back down. But this is the one thing that we want to encourage you with is that boldness apart from repentance makes a bully on both sides. That if you don't feel love and compassion for a fellow human being, then we would tell you just don't say anything. You stay seated. But when you start with repentance, dealing with your own self, that leads to humility. And on that basis of humility, you see yourself through the lens of who God is and who you are in relation to Him. And then that will lead to love for God and love for people. And when that fills your heart, then boldness will be the natural that's outpouring you, of that. And that's so, when you take a stand. David and I are encouraging everybody, start with, re with repentance, then it migrates to love. And I want to tell you, then you can be bold as a lion and, and you will never back down. Our nation needs us. It's time. Yeah, I just thought that was good, a good word, especially from a couple of construction guys. The, uh, the idea that, uh, that we, we can be a bully just like the other side, but we need, we need a, a supernatural work of God's grace and repentance in our own hearts so that our own hearts can be filled with love for, for others, even the opposition. Uh, so then, then we can stand up uh, and then we can be bold for Jesus Christ. And that's, these are the days that we're living in. This is, this is what we need, need to do. Uh, this is what the early church did uh, in terms of prayer and how God was able to use them. And then the word of God was, uh, was multiplied uh, and it went everywhere. And that's what we want to see. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we do.
When I go, don't cry for me In my Father's arms I'll be The wounds this world left on my soul Well, I'll be healed and I'll be whole Sun and moon will be replaced With the light of Jesus' face
Nice. 